Good morning. This world has gone certifiably mad. Have you heard that before? This world has gone certifiably mad. That's how Pastor Mark started his sermon last Sunday. I draw you back there today for the very simple purpose of making this statement. Isn't it awesome that that was true last Sunday, but one week later now, the world is perfect. Isn't it? You mean to tell me that last week the world was certifiably mad and and this week it's still certifiably mad? Come on! In one week, clearly, everything has gotten better, right? In fact, it may have gotten worse. At least worse for some of us. This morning before worship started, I had multiple conversations with people who shared with me that over the last week they have learned of new medical diagnoses that were not good. Of tests and challenges. I, over the last week, had a family sit in my office preparing for divorce. Now that sounds super strange, but they're actually preparing for divorce, at least the wife is, because she's convinced the husband is preparing to leave her. Just minutes ago, I had someone stand in the entryway and say to me, Pastor, this past week I buried three of my closest friends. The world hasn't gotten phenomenally better in a course of a week from being certifiably mad to now perfect. In fact, at least for those people, the world has gotten worse in the course of a week. And that's not even to mention what happened last Tuesday. Did any of you stay up late at night on Tuesday? Maybe later than you should have? Expecting now it's going to turn and you woke up Wednesday morning to riots and protests and petitions and burning cars and the world didn't suddenly get better, did it? And my guess is, and this is what's hard, by the way, of being the pastor on a Sunday like this, where this is the topic and these are the picked readings as we as we close out a year. Did you know that New Year's is coming in just a couple of weeks? Not in January, in fact, but in the church world, we're wrapping down the church year and preparing for a new church year to start as we enter the Advent season. As we wrap down the end, we have to come face to face with the reality that life isn't necessarily getting better and maybe getting worse sitting in the pews right now are those few that are like, Pastor, and you've only scratched the surface of the crud I'm dealing with as a person. Like, that that's all I know. That's the tip of the iceberg of the hardships that we face as people, and yet I realize that there's a whole block of ice under the water in your lives that I don't know about. The world was certifiably mad, and it still is, and may be getting worse. Behavioral scientists tell us that in the face of challenge, in the face of trauma, in the face of hardships, in the face of adversity, that we tend to respond as human creatures in one of two ways, right? We tend to want to fight. 
in the face of adversity and challenges, some of us default to a fight setting. We, cr- we clench the fist and we want to charge straight into the situation. We strengthen our resolve. We buck up and we think nobody's going to take it down. Come on. Pretending you're a challenge. I like the record to reflect that I just went after the largest guy in this room. <laughs> right? Some of us respond with a flight response. I mean, a fight response. We want to we want to clench our fists and we want to take it on. We charge the challenge and we think, I can do this. I'm strong enough. I'm fast enough. I can do this. And we, and we fight. Some of us, however, face adversity by having a flight response. Now, this one's not quite as appealing. It's not quite as socially cool. But some of us, when we face adversity, we go literally or figuratively to our bedrooms and we do this maneuver and we plug our ears and we la-la ourselves, pretending that the world doesn't actually exist. We try and ignore it. We try and flee from the challenges that are before us. And while that's not as appealing, at least by our cultural standards of fighting, I would argue with you that both responses are inadequate in the midst of a world that not only has gone mad, but may be going more mad daily. It's inadequate to either fight or to flee. Jesus is preparing to go to the cross in Luke's gospel. At least this is the way that Luke is going to tell the story under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is preparing to go to the cross. And right before those events unfold with his betrayal and the foot washing and all of those things that happened on Monday, Thursday and beyond, right before that, Luke tells us that he enters into a little teaching session with his followers. Grab your Bible, if you would. We're going to look at that teaching session a little bit today. It's in Luke chapter 21. Our reading picked up today in verse 25, but honestly, we could go back almost to the front end of chapter 21, because in this whole section, Jesus is laying out the fact that the world not only has gone mad, but is preparing to go much more so. That the world is going to go truly Mad. Here's what our reading said, in case you missed it. And then, and there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth, distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming to the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Does that sound at all familiar to you? I'm not talking about familiar like, yes, I've heard that from the scriptures before, but as you lived through the last week, does that seem to find resonance? That the world will be shaken, that it will be troubled, that it will quake and experience difficulties? Does that sound familiar to you? Jesus is is speaking directly to the trauma of hardships. However, Jesus is not speaking directly to the hardships that you faced this last week. Yes, you heard that correctly. Luke 21 is actually not... Jesus looking forward to the end of the world and saying, get ready for when Donald Trump is elected president. Jesus is looking forward, all right. He's looking forward all the way to 70 AD when the temple in Jerusalem was knocked down and destroyed. 
Did you hear that? This section of scripture, as much as it sounds relevant to the world that we live in, and we tend to live in a world that likes to fixate on the trauma and the hardship and throw up our hands and say, oh no, it's the end of the world. Woe is me because I like this or I don't like that or whatever. In the midst of the hardships, we like to throw up our hands and pretend like it's the end of the world. And yet here, Jesus is not talking about the end of the world. He's talking about a few decades from now when the temple in Jerusalem will be destroyed. And we know that because we get to look back on events and we get to realize that in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. And Christians were scattered to the four corners of the world. And they were punished. And they were put to death. And the church grew And more and more and more and more and more people came to know of the hope that we have in Jesus, even including all the way in the far hinter region of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. People now know of Jesus because of the hardship that was faced in 70 AD. Jesus looks forward and he says, listen, a time is coming when you're going to face true Hardship. Verse 28. Now when these things begin to take place, these things meaning the destruction of the temple, when these things begin to take shape, place, straighten up, raise your heads, because the redemption is drawing near. Straighten up. Don't slouch and be woe is me. Straighten up. Lift your heads because redemption is drawing near. In other words, in the midst of the hardship, I'm going to do something pretty cool. But instead of fighting, instead of that being your response and wanting to duel with a culture that has changed, not only in Jesus' day, which it did change dramatically, but also in our day, as it is changing dramatically, the response is not to fight, church. Nor is the response to bury our head in our hands and hide. It's not fight. And it's not flight, it's faith. Straighten up, look up, for salvation is drawing near. It's coming, it's here, in fact. The response of the church in the midst of the hardships, in the midst of job loss, as one person told me recently, they just lost their job, and if you didn't know this, it's hard to pay bills when you don't have a job. In the midst of divorce that's imminent, in the, vo- in, the, in the midst of cancer or dying friends, in the midst of all of that, the response is not fight or flight, it's faith. It's when we stand as the church and we trust nothing else because everything else the scriptures tell us is shifting sand. We trust nothing else except God and his promises. And for the record, this is a super scary place to hang out. Because this often doesn't make sense to us. But this is not about making sense to us. This is about trusting the one who holds it in his hands. The response is not fight or flight. It's faith. It's believing God's promises to us. That there is life beyond our comprehension. That there is hope beyond our circumstances, beyond our hardships. That's the response of faith. That's the response of God's people in the midst of hardships, or at least it should be. I told you that we're wrapping down the church year and that we have these assigned readings. If you didn't know that, there are assigned readings, in fact, for these seasons of the church year. Uh, The assigned gospel reading that we already heard is kind of gloom and doom, right? It's kind of Jesus doing this whole, woe is me, the temple's going to be destroyed in 70. And, And it's kind of ironic to me that partnered with that kind of message of gloom and doom destruction is our psalm reading for today. So if you still have your Bible out, I'm going to encourage you to flip there with me to Psalm 98. 
And on first take, these two things may not seem to fit together at all. Like I said, one is a little gloom and doom, destruction-esque, and one, well, let me read it to you. Psalm 98 says this, O sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth, like Cape Girardeau, all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and with the sound of melody, with the trumpets and with the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the king. You heard that right. Before the king, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and all who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth, and he will judge the earth with righteousness. And the peoples, he will judge the peoples with equity. The response of faith is pretty simple. It's kind of laid out here. In Psalm 98, it is to sing to the Lord a new song and realize that today is new because God is also at work in the world. It is to skip down a couple verses and to make a joyful noise to the Lord. You can skip down a couple more verses and it is to sing praises to the Lord with a whole bunch of instruments, by the way. Why? Because he will judge the world with righteousness. And he will judge the people with equity. As we wrap out the church year and as we roll into probably another week of stupid craziness, I mean, I don't want to spoil it for you. So if you don't like the end of the movie, you can plug your ears. But but let me give you a little spoiler. This week's probably not going to get better either. Does that ruin it for you? If you like hold out hope that last week didn't quite get it done, but this week's going to be perfect. The world's not necessarily going to get better this week either, but we as God's people don't respond by fighting it or fleeing it. We respond by trusting the God who holds it in his hands. That's the response of faith in the midst of life's turmoil. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, you are good. And your mercy endures forever. God, in the midst of all of the craziness that we're dealing with, all of the hardships that we're facing, be that the death of friends, the death of family, the loss of employment, the shifting family dynamics. God, be that health challenges for ourselves or for others in the face of political difficulties and chaos and protests and petitions in the midst of all that life throws at us Lord we desire to respond in faith to trust you and to trust your promises to lean into your grace and to celebrate that you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, help us to sing a new song. Help us to make a joyful noise. Help us to sing your praises so that the world, even in the midst of life's hardships, that the world may know you. Lord, use us this week to that end. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.